Hi, my name is Rebecca, and today I'm going to be talking about figure 1710 from the 5th edition of Robert Weaver's Molecular Biology textbook on the role of GTP hydrolysis in translation initiation complex formation. This video is made as part of MCDB 427 Molecular Biology at the University of Michigan. So before jumping into the actual experiment, I'm going to spend a little bit of time discussing what we already know about initiation complex formation specifically the role of initiation factor 2, or IF2. We know IF2 is able to bind GTP, and when bound to GTP, it can join the 30S initiation complex along with initiation factors 1 and 3. Once these three initiation factors are bound to the 30S subunit, the mRNA and tRNA are recruited to the complex. Then the 50S subunits recruited to the complex, and IF1 and IF3 are expelled. We also know from past experiments that 50S and IF2 together demonstrate GTPase activity, meaning that the GTP can be hydrolyzed in the presence of both IF2 and 50S. Which leads us to the question that we don't know, which is, what is the role of GTP hydrolysis in initiation complex formation? From past experiments, we know that tRNA recruitment to the initiation complex is not affected by GTP hydrolysis. This leaves us two possibilities. Either GTP hydrolysis aids in the recruitment of 50S to the initiation complex, or it allows IF2 to leave the initiation complex. To answer this question, the researchers did an in vitro experiment to determine what happens in the presence of GTP hydrolysis. To do this, they added cold 30S subunits along with cold IF1 and cold AUG sequence mRNA to a test tube. Next, the researchers added 32 phosphorus labeled IF2 in a limiting quantity. And we we're just going to note here that IF2 is not a phosphorylated protein, but it can be phosphorylated with a specific kinase that the researchers used. And this is going to allow us to track where IF2 ends up in the reaction. They also added tritium labeled FMET tRNA FMET to this reaction to help initiation complex formation. Then they added 50S ribosomal subunits to form the 70S complexes. And then in one of the reactions, they added GDPCP, and then the other they added GTP. So you may be wondering, what's the difference between these two? Well, if we look at the structures, you can see that they're pretty similar. And essentially, GDPCP is an analog to GTP, but instead of the phosphodiester bond between the gamma and beta phosphate groups, it is now replaced by a methylene group. And the implication of this is that when you add water to the reaction, the bond in GDP-CP is no longer hydrolyzable like it is in GTP. So this allowed the researchers to control for what occurs when GTP is hydrolyzed. So the researchers went ahead and added GDP-CP or GTP to each of these reactions and allowed the molecules all to incubate together to form complexes. Once the complex is formed, they subjected them to sucrose gradient ultracentrifugation, which is a separation technique that separates molecules by size with the largest ones migrating near the bottom and the smallest ones migrating near the top. So they did this and collected multiple fractions, and within each fraction they tracked the radio labeled IF2 and FMET tRNA to see if the locations of either of these changed based on each of the treatment groups. So here's the data that the researchers got, and we're just going to take this panel by panel before coming back and synthesizing all the information. So let's start with this panel on the left, which is the GDP-CP experiment, or the non-hydrolyzable analog. We can see that we have this strong peak around fraction 10, which is where 70S migrates. And we can see that almost all of the IF2 GDP-CP migrates along with 70S. And we can see we also have a substantial amount of FMET tRNA FMET migrating with 70S. This means we're having a species that looks something like this migrating in our column where we have both the FMET tRNA and the GDP CP bound IF2 migrating along with the full 70S complex. But you'll also notice near the right end of this graph that we have all this excess FMET tRNA migrating near the top of the column. So now moving on to the panel on the right or the GTP column, we see a little bit of difference between the two. The first thing is around 70S here. We can see we have FMAT tRNA still migrating with 70S, but for the IF2, we see this migrating now near 30S. So now we have two different species of complexes migrating in the column. We have this 70S with the labeled tRNA still attached to it, 
And then, no IF2 anymore, so IF2 must have dissociated from the 70S complex, and it reassociates with a new molecule GTP on a new 30S subunit. So from this data, we were able to determine that GTP hydrolysis does indeed allow IF2 to dissociate from the 70S initiation complex. But there's still more data that we can get if we compare the two graphs side by side. And if we look at the peaks around 70S, we could see that in the presence of GTP, much more FMET tRNA FMET is binding to the 70S than in the presence of GDP CP. So what's the implications of this? Well, if you remember at the beginning, IF2 was limiting, which means that IF2 doesn't act stoichiometrically. Instead, what happens is that, well, when GTP is hydrolyzed on IF2, the G IF2 then leaves and dissociates, and it's able to rebind a new molecule of GTP that's in excess. And when it rebinds a new molecule of GTP, it's able to reassociate with a 30S subunit along with initiation factors 1 and 3, which then recruits another molecule of tRNA and mRNA to a 30S ribosomal subunit, and then the entire process is able to start over again. So 50S gets recruited again, and then GTP is hydrolyzed, IF1 and 3 leave, and then IF2 leaves again. So IF2 can continue to be recycled in the system over and over again. So in summary, the two main conclusions that we can draw from this experiment are that GTP hydrolysis releases IF2 from the 70S initiation complex, and then IF2 is able to be recycled to recruit tRNA to newly formed initiation complexes. So that's figure 17.10 from Robert Weaver's fifth edition of Molecular Biology. Thank you so much for watching, and go blue!